This is a podcast of Scripps Institution of Oceanography at UC San Diego. To learn more about how you can support Scripps, visit us online at scripps.ucsd.edu. Around the world, people are looking for new solutions to mitigate the harmful buildup of greenhouse gases, such as carbon dioxide, and counter the dangers posed by the planet's warming climate. Foremost in this quest is the search for new ways to loosen humanity's dependence on fossil fuel consumption. Recently, renewed hope has been placed on deriving fuel from biologically based sources such as plants. Yet the once promising prospects of generating expansive amounts of fuel from land-based plants such as corn and soybean have declined in recent years. Now, researchers at Scripps Institution of Oceanography UC San Diego's Division of Biological Sciences and around the San Diego region are looking to the oceans for a next generation biofuel source. Well, I'm a marine biologist and in the ocean the ecosystem is supported by the photosynthesis of the microscopic plants. So my interests are to study and model mass and energy flow in ocean ecosystems. It all starts with absorption of light from the sun by the microscopic plants, the phytoplankton. Phytoplankton are extremely efficient. For example, they represent less than 1% of the biomass of plants on Earth, and yet they produce about half of the oxygen of all plant photosynthesis on Earth. But from a sustainability point of view, they're also extremely compelling. For example, the organisms we study in the sea grow in seawater. It's salt water. Salt water is not good for human drinking or for our cows to drink or for irrigation water. However, we can grow the algae in seawater and we can put the growth systems on non-arable land that can't otherwise be used for agriculture. So we can have a huge impact on producing biofuel and feed protein on non-arable land using seawater, therefore saving our precious topsoils and saving our precious water, which is gonna be a crisis. Furthermore, algae can take CO2 up or they require CO2 directly from the water medium they grow in. Therefore, it's possible to put CO2 from a point source like a power plant stack gas, put it straight into the seawater and then deliver it to the algae system very inexpensively via a pipeline. And this way, the algae will be taking up the CO2 to create their biomass. Despite the enticing prospects of algae, much remains to be learned about how they grow and produce the oils, called lipids, that scientists and engineers can turn into biofuel. Bill Gerwick, who explores marine sources to develop biomedical products to treat human diseases, recently began researching lipid oils in algae. So when microalgae, when we take a, a little inoculum, a few cells, and put it into a flask, uh, they're surrounded by nutrients and uh, uh, light that we provide, and so they grow and they divide, and mainly what they're producing are the cell walls and the proteins and the DNA that allow them to, uh, that are necessary for growth and for uh, new cellular uh, composition. As those cultures mature though, and nutrients start to diminish, and they use, have used that supply of nitrogen and phosphorus up out of their culture supply, they uh, continue to photosynthesize, but they have no place to put that photosynthate. And what they do then is they put it into lipid reserves, not unlike the way that we store away when we have a, a, a turkey dinner and store away some as uh, uh, oils around our midsection. Uh, algae store away the extra photosynthate as lipid oils, and this is a source of energy for them uh, in times when maybe there's not enough sunlight. So th these are the very same oils that we want to harvest as biofuels and ultimately use in a capacity like a biodiesel. So we've uh, been engaged in some preliminary uh, uh, work in this uh, area, and uh, I'm actually very excited about some of the things that we're finding, and that is that we have been able to grow uh, cultures in the laboratory of some of the same microalgae that are being considered as candidates for large pond cultures out in the, perhaps out in the uh, Imperial Valley or elsewhere in desert type locations. And uh, we've been able to add small molecules to these cultures which greatly expand their growth rate and their production of oils. Scripps research biologist Mark Hildebrand has been investigating the genetics underlying lipid production in algae. Marine algae produce lipid oils when they are starved for nutrients. When adequately fed, they produce carbohydrates instead. 
Hildebrand is looking into tiny algae called diatoms to find out how the organisms dictate or partition lipids or carbohydrates. The results could deliver vital new information for biofuel development. So the idea is that if we can understand the, the underlying gene regulation, that will help us understand how the pathway that partitions carbon into carbohydrates or into lipids is regulated, and that will be the first step. And so subsequent to that, once we identify those genes, the other thing we're doing in our lab is developing genetic manipulation approaches so we can introduce DNA, DNA into diatoms and change their, <coughs> their uh, metabolic pathways um, with some more development. And the idea is if we identify a gene that's critical for this partitioning, for example, and we find that, well, if we knock that gene out or if we overexpress that gene, we might be able to permanently make the cells accumulate lipid rather than just do it under nutrient limitation conditions. So that's kind of the ultimate goal for what we're trying to do. Beyond the research frontiers, the researchers acknowledge that a range of challenges remains in order to turn the biofuel promise of algae into the clean, efficient energy solution needed for the environmental health of the planet. Currently, the, the most economically viable way of doing this is to grow algal cultures in large outdoor ponds and they're open systems and so contamination with other organisms is a really big issue. And one of the, the goals would be to develop or isolate strains that could grow, say, at extreme conditions, so extreme salinity or extreme pH, so that other competing organisms wouldn't grow well. So you would then take the lessons you've learned from your model system, find a s strain or species that grows well under the extreme conditions and try and adapt that into those. There are many challenges to go from this lab-based studies that I do that can predict outcomes to actually making commercially viable products. I think these are not so much scientific problems specifically where you don't know the answer. We know what we have to do. It has to do with interdisciplinary engineering of solutions. The biologists, the chemists, the physicists, the engineers, the economists all have to work together in an integrated way, interdisciplinary way, to find the integrated solutions across the full value chain. This has been a presentation of Scripps Institution of Oceanography at UC San Diego.